Hey, everybody. Uh, we are back with the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. This is Emily speaking, and I'm here with Dr. Hillary. And I'm really excited for our little conversation today. We are going to start doing these shorter little podcasts for you guys that cover some current event topics in the health, nutrition, maybe even some hunting topics. And today, Dr. Hillary is going to be in the interviewee seat, and I'm going to be sort of interviewing her and just chatting about seed oils, which is a very hot topic in the world today and has been for a while. And Hillary talks about this all day, every day with people and um, just really think it's an important topic. So we're going to touch on it today. So here's Doc Hillary with us. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Awesome. So we're going to jump right into it today. And um, Hillary, why don't you tell us a little bit, a little bit of an overview on seed oil. So what is a seed oil or what are the seed oils that we're concerned with? Yeah. So in today's uh, food climate, as we know, seed oils, that would include um, canola oil, first of all, vegetable oil. So anytime you see like a vegetable oil, that would be considered a seed oil, canola oil, corn oil, soy oil, safflower oil, uh, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, and uh, grapeseed oil. So, and maybe there's another one there, but that's, and if you think about something like Crisco, or something like that, that would be considered in the seed oil category as well. These oils are um, processed from, um, these oils are processed from seeds. That's why they're called seed oils. And so all of those oils I just named off have a seed, right? Like corn has a seed and soy has a seed. Um, canola oil comes from the rape seed. Um, safflower, sunflower, those are all seeds. And so they are basically processing the seed and getting the oil from the seed. And they're using it as a omega-6 replacement in food. And um, these are called uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids and they're in a group of fats and um, in the omega they're omega-6s. So we have, we have a balance that we need in our body of omega-6s and omega-3s. Um, and we're obviously going to talk about the massive consumption of these seed oils and how it's completely thrown off our omega-3, omega-6 uh, ratios because we're eating way too many omega-6s, which the seed oils fall into. Um, but those are what seed oils would be. What is not included in seed oils would be anything that's pressed from like a fruit or like an olive. So um, I guess all is considered a fruit. So olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, um, those, I guess you could say, do have seeds in the middle, but they're actually processing it from the fruit, not from the seed. So those are the oils that um, are not polyunsaturated fatty acids um, that are going to be causing the oxidant damage, et cetera. And they do not come from the seeds. They come from the fruit. So way back in May, uh, I did a couple of webinars. I did a men's health webinar and I did a women's health webinar. They were live and folks were able to come on, watch the webinar and then ask questions at the end of the webinars. And it turned out to be really successful, much more than I thought it would be. And so Emily, who's here with me, um, her and I had this discussion of let's do a monthly live webinar that anybody can join. Doesn't cost anything. It's free. If you just want to sign up your email, we will send you a link and you can join us. The nice thing about the live webinar is you can ask your questions, right? That was kind of the cool part about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're going to do these webinars once a month and we've kind of outlined some topics that we've gotten from folks in the past, and I'm going to create a small PowerPoint. It's going to be through a zoom call. So you'll be able to watch and you'll also be able to listen. And then at the end, you'll be able to ask questions. Um, and if you can't make it live, the good thing is because it doesn't cost you anything, uh, we're going to put it out as podcasts. So it's going to help us build our podcast library. 
but it's also going to give you a chance if you want to ask me directly a question on a Zoom call. So Emily, you want to go over just a little bit of the calendar and maybe what we're looking at for these webinars for the next few months? Yes, sure. So we have one scheduled for next Wednesday, which is August 30th. And Hillary is going to be going over toxins, how to decrease toxicity in our lives. So things like hormone disrupting toxins and how it affects our hormones, all of those types of things. So that one's coming up here at the end of August. And then um, at the beginning of September, tentatively September 6th, um, Hillary is going to do another webinar on endometriosis, which is a very hot topic. And so we're going to touch on all things to do with that. And a couple of weeks later, we are then going to be doing one on keeping a healthy blood sugar sugar and why that is important. And a couple of more that we have coming down the pike as we get into the fall and winter months, <clears throat> we're going to talk about genetics and um, warrior versus warrior gene, which Hillary really wants to share with you guys. We have one on menopause and healing foods from menopause and perimenopause and all of those fun hormone types of things. And um, there's some others, but those are the, the ones that are going to be coming the in the next couple of weeks and months. And we're going to continue on as we go from there. But that's what we've got coming, coming soon. Right. So those will be each podcast will be on a Wednesday night. At what time, Emily? Um, we had been doing, I believe, six o'clock mountain time. Okay. So we're going to put these dates on the website at stealthyhunter.com under programs. You'll be able to go there and you'll be able to see the list of webinars, the topics that we're going to talk about and how you get into that webinar. So please, if you want to be part of that, we'd love to have you. If not, it's just going to build great content for the uh, podcast. But uh, yeah, please check out the health webinars. Emily and I work hard on those. And uh, we just want to help to serve you guys better. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Em. So that leads into my next question. Why are these seed oils in everything? Because I know a lot of our listeners currently are or are aiming to read food labels and obviously make better health choices and they're health conscious people. So if we know they're so bad and we have alternatives, why are they in everything that we eat? If you notice on food labels, they're always in there if you're not careful. I mean, you really have to be conscious. So why is this? Yeah. So there's a little, there's so much interesting history about actually the use of seed oils in our, um, culture, the Western culture and kind of how they've turned into a food source. Uh, they did not used to be a food source. So in, um, there's some interesting t statistics. So I'm going to probably jump around a little bit because there's a lot of information here, statistically understanding what we've been seeing in the last 200 years that's been happening with our food supply, number one. Um, so if you think about it, obviously this is a podcast that's talking to hunters and uh, people that obviously wanna be more sustainable that are maybe doing animal husbandry, that are eating animal products. And perhaps there's a percentage of people here that don't eat the animal products like um, flesh meat, maybe they just eat fish and eggs, like um, et cetera. But in 1900, which have been a little over a hundred years ago, 99% of um, our daily intake of fat came from animal uh, fats. Okay. So 99%, we had 1% that came from an omega-6 seed oil of some sort. And that was mainly, it, it mainly started with cotton seed oil. Um, cotton seed oil was used to, was made for machinery and lamp oil. That's what they initially used it for is an industrial oil. And they still use these oils for industrial oil today, but um, they started adding it to food in uh, right after the Civil War. So prior to the Civil War in 1865, basically omega-6s, which these fall under, was about 1% per day in your diet, okay, prior to 1965. Um, today, or in 2008, the statistic that I found, to, in 2008, Omega-6 was 11.8% of our diet. Now, what would cause that, right? Like why would our omega-6s go from 1% to 11% in 
in you know that time frame and they they we know that it's from the introduction of seed oils into the diet um and so in again prior to the civil war there was really no seed oils at all and then right after the civil war they started uh making seed oils like i said cotton seed oil and um i think part of it was that uh, what was happening in the United States was we were having a massive change in industrialization. And so we had to feed large amounts of people. And we were trying to figure out how to create a uh, food that was easier to make. And so this is when the processing of food really started. Prior to 1865, we really were not seeing much, if any, processing in our food supply. So that would mean like a refined, refined, re, re, refined. Uh, mm -hmm. a refined grain that was almost impossible to find two people like actually grew their grain or they got whole grain and they ground it at home or whatever, but they were not processing it. Like refineries were not processing refined grain as much, um, at least in the United States. And so, um, after the war that changed, we started realizing, okay, we need, we, we need to feed a lot more people. Um, and then, so they started processing the food more and, um, let's see. So when they started processing the food more, um, so in 1822, there's this interesting timeline, 1822 sugar consumption increased. So we added more sugar, refined sugar into the food supply. Um, and so you could say a lot of the correlation that you'll start to see in the beginning of this kind of Western epidemic of diseases started also with sugar. So we can't take sugar out of the mix, but that was in 1822. And then in 1866, cotton seed oil was introduced to the U.S. food supply. And then in 1880, they started processing wheat flour. So they were processing wheat flour and turning it into refined grain. And then in 1911, Crisco was introduced <laughs> and Crisco was a trans fat that could be used to make like pie crust. I mean, I remember my grandma used to use Crisco to make like pie crust instead of butter. It was affordable. It was cheap. Right. And especially like you think the early 1900s up through the depression, people maybe didn't have as much money. And so they were using things like Crisco instead of animal fat, tallow, lard, those kinds of things. Um, and then by 2009, oh, so I won't get into that yet. So um, there was absolutely no seed oils before the Civil War. That's the big takeaway here. Today, or in the, you know, between 2010 and today, 2023, 80 grams per day of our diet comes from processed seed oils. So in 1865, there was absolutely no processed seed oils. And today, we have about 80 grams per day. And what that equals out to is six, in 2009, that equaled out to 63% of the diet in America comes from an omega-6 processed seed. Okay. Now people are like, well, wait, how is that even possible? Don't you think I would know if I was eating 63% of my diet from a processed like seed oil, right? Because when people think of oil, they think about when they add it to their food or when they make salad dressing or when they cook something in oil or when they deep fry it. Yeah, you get it from that. But because of food processing that started heavily after the Civil War, especially in the early part of the 20th century, um, they're adding these oils to the food that's being processed. So you don't actually know you're eating it because you're not making the food. So it's, but they're adding it into the food. So that's where we see this huge increase in omega-6, which that, that amount, I mean, doing 63% um, of your calories per day from seed oil means that you are greatly changing also that omega-3 to omega-6. And we've seen in America and other Westernized countries is that uh, omega-3 consumption has gone down right? So we hear about fish oil. We hear about fatty fish. Uh, we hear maybe about flaxseed oil, some of these highly rich omega-3 oils, but people are typically not consuming as much of that in their daily diet as they are consuming these omega-6s. And part of it is they don't even realize they're consuming the omega-6. So that's, um, 
that's an interesting timeline and, and how it got started getting added to the food supply. And basically, um, yeah, kind of, kind of actually alarming just in the processing of food. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> that's extremely alarming because like you said, this, there is a component of sugar still, but people will understand, I think more that sugar is bad for you. That's like the added sugar in things, you know, we need natural sugars, et cetera. But, um, so people kind of have had their eye out for that and understand that. But, um, I know cause in our house, I, we have almost completely cut out seed oils and everything. And it takes a ton of effort to do that in terms of when you buy things. Of course, if you're making things, you can just use olive oil or avocado oil, or we use bear oil, you yep, know, bear fat. you know, so though that's what we use when we're actually cooking with oil, but it's, it's in every, most processed foods. And if it's not in them, you're, you're paying for it, which in my eyes is worth it, it does, but you are going to pay maybe, you know, 25 to 50% more in getting a processed food that doesn't have them. So I bet if listeners look in their pantries and things that you would think are healthy, you're going to see a seed oil in them a lot. Yeah. Of and I, I mean, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. And at the same time, be like, I'm perfect. I don't do this because here's the deal. I mean, you figure if you, if Americans are eating that and they think they're eating healthy, these are even people that are thinking, and the food is marketed as healthy and the food is marketed as, you know, fat, low fat, um, healthy fats, whatever people mm -hmm. are trying to do the best they can. So honestly, a lot of people are very innocent in what's happening because the food supply now is so heavily processed. Um, we are all so dependent on the food supply in many ways. So like if I grow my own garden and we get our own meat, okay, that's great. But I got to make sure that I'm canning and preserving and freeze drying my veggies or freezing my veggies for the winter. Because if I'm not doing that, I'm going to go to a store, right? I can't grow coconuts here. I can't grow avocados here. I do have bare fat. We do, you know, we, we could get tallow from animals. Like, I mean, we have, as far as like, like you and I, and the knowledge that we have in our community has like our ability to utilize whole foods and to provide for ourselves is immense. Okay. But if you look at the majority of the population that lives in cities, even in a city, you can do a lot for yourself. But when you're reliant on a grocery store, um, and a lot of places around the world are like this, you know, you even go to small villages in Europe or you go, whatever, you know, they go to the market every single day, they buy their food every single day. And we'll get to that here in a second, other places in the world and, and, um, why maybe America is so affected by this. But I do think that, um, it's very difficult to avoid these, like you said, and innocently we're, we're consuming these sometimes and we don't even know it, or we want to go out to eat. And they're using these oils because they're cheap. You know, restaurants have to have a bottom line. And a restaurant is actually not a monkey, very good money-making business. Um, there's a lot of overhead. There's a ton of expense. And so, you know, restaurants, unless you are going to a place that's charging a lot of money and they are touting that they do everything above board, you know, with no seed oils or whatever. But I mean, even my friend, you know, Scott, who's a chef, he's been on here many times. He's like, I mean... Most people are using canola oil because it's cheap because you can get large bats of it and feed, you know, make tons of food every night with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, every, most people eat out nowadays, even people that don't have a lot of money eat out. You go to fast food, guaranteed you are eating, um, you are eating these oils. And I think the, I think the idea behind them initially was, uh, we can provide a lot more food for people. But what's happened is we've seen this complete, um, if you want to say correlation does not create causation, in this case, that would be false. It, it would totally be true when you look at the statistics of what has happened since we have added this to our food supply, what has happened in diseases and has happened in human health at least in America and also other Western countries. So a lot of the research that I was looking at was definitely U.S., UK, Israel, China, even now, it would be considered a westernized country at this point, the way they're starting to feed their people and the way they're starting to eat. 
um, Austria, Australia, New Zealand. So these are countries that are have greatly increased their uh, vegetable oil and their seed oils into their food su su supply. And what you see is the chronic diseases that affect most, um, you know, Americans, and they're affecting these countries as well. And what's really interesting, um, not only are we seeing things like obesity. So let's talk about obesity a little bit. We hear a lot about obesity, right? Everybody's getting fat. And you see all these things like more people are obese than ever. Um, you just look around the population, you know, go to an airport or something. You're just like, oh my gosh, like everybody in here is at least got a good 10 or more pounds on them. You know, it just seems to be the state. Maybe not in Bozeman, maybe not in Kalispell, but in most of the country, when you go out, you'll see these things, right? So here's an interesting thing. In 1900s, obesity was 1.2% of the population, okay, in 1900. That was just a little less than 100 years ago. In 1960, it was 13.4%. Now, a lot of people think that this obesity epidemic didn't start until after the 80s. But we do know because of that timeline I gave you about adding processed things like sugar, seed oils, et cetera, into the food supply starting after the Civil War, that we see a kind of a steady in, incline continuing to go up. But in 1960, it was about 13% of the population. In 2018, it was 42.5% of the population is obese, okay? This is not just overweight, this is obese. And they're, they're looking at like to 2030, they believe about 49.4% of the US population will be obese. Okay, now that's about half of the population is going to be obese by 2030. And what's interesting, the other thing is cancer. So we've got obesity, um, we've got cancer. In 1811, 0.5% of deaths in the United States were from cancer. Okay, that was one in 188 deaths. In 1900, it was 5.8%, which was one in 17. And in 2010, it was 31.1% of deaths. One in three people die from cancer. Okay. Now, what's freaky about that is if you look at the introduction of sugar and you look at the introduction of seed oils, you see this completely uh, complete relationship on the graph. So you see sugar going up, you see seed oils coming into the food supply, you see obesity going up, you see cancer going up right when these things get introduced, especially seed oils. Now, what's interesting is that sugar consumption has actually decreased since 2004. And I think this is because people think that they know that sugar is not great for them, right? We made a lot of changes. We've used, not, we've used a lot more natural sweeteners. We've used, we've made these synthetic sweeteners like sucralose, aspartame, whatever, over time, knowing that consuming a lot of sugar was probably not good for us because we were seeing these numbers. But since 2004, sugar is way down in consumption, but obesity is increasing. So if obesity was just directly correlated to sugar intake, then that doesn't make sense. Um, let's even look at diabetes. In 1990, diabetes was about 2.9% of the population. And in 2016, we see 13% of the population having diabetes. So that is like a ginormous jump in not very much time, okay? And so when you look at the increased addition of seed oils to the food supply, it is correlates along with that line. Um, and then across the world, introducing seed oils into the food supply in like a lot of those other countries that I talked about, you also see this high increase in these diseases. Um, actually, what's interesting is Israel seems to be the most affected right now. Like Israel has the highest amount of seed oils in their food supply, and they are having the highest rates of obesity, at, in line at rate of obesity increasing. So it's, um, it's a little bit scary. And, um, 
you know, depending on where you're at, you know, our society right now is consuming about one eighth to one third of their calories from seed oils. And like I said before, you may not know you're eating it. You have to read labels, like you said. Um, and so we can we can talk a little, maybe we should talk a little bit about what the seed oil is actually doing. Do we do that? Yeah, I think that would be great. <laughs> that was fun. Okay. Question. So, so I, yeah. think, <laughs> I think that it's confusing. There's a lot of biochemistry involved here and we won't get heavy into the biochemistry, but um, what polyunsaturated fatty acids do in the body, omega-6 to omega-3, is they tend to be more pro-inflammatory. So when you look at the prostaglandin, um, like in biochemistry, when you're looking at it, like if I do a blood test on somebody and I wanna see, do they have enough omega-3s? How much omega-6s do they have? You can do these tests and you can look. And so you'll get this chart back that shows you the omega-6 and all the enzymes that are the, the bottom thing is like EPA and DHA, which you would mainly get from like a fish oil supplement. That's the end product. That's what you want to get to. And then on the omega-6 sign aside, you'll see all these, this pathway as well with enzymes. This one, omega-6s tend to be more inflammatory and omega-3s tend to be more anti-inflammatory. So you can imagine if we're eating all this omega-6 and we're eating not very much omega-3, we just have a lot more pro-inflammatory and oxidant damaging products that are going to damage the cells. And so in that, we just have more inflammation. So to simplify it, if you've got a lot of omega-6s coming in and the ratio is not good, where those omega-3s are kind of keeping omega-6 in check, mm -hmm. omega-6 is going crazy and it's just causing all this oxidant damage, which means that's going to affect the cell. Um, to put it simply. Um, and what happens when you process the seed oil itself is it gets oxidized. So when actually processing seed oils, these seed oil plants, they look like chemical processing plants. They look like refineries because the process to make an oil from these seeds is highly laborious and it's very complicated. And so I mean, if you go online and you look some pictures of like a seed oil factory, they literally look like refineries because they're making oil from this raw product, right? And um, so the process of making the seed oil itself is very oxidizing, which means the minute you eat it, it goes into your body and its chances of creating oxidation in your body is high. And m most people may not know what oxidation is, but basically what oxidation does is it creates free radicals in the body that react with oxygen. And because we breathe in oxygen, that's our main, you know, energy source for life, um, that those free radicals, the more you have in your body, the more oxidant damage can be done in your body. Um, basically that, that oxygenation of that free Free radical causes damage to the cell in some ways. And really the end product of that is mitochondrial damage. And mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They make ATP. They're implicated in just about everything, especially making energy from your food, right? When you eat a carb, you eat a fat, you eat a protein, it goes through the Krebs cycle and it does all these biochemical processes and then goes into the electron transport chain, which is in the mitochondria, which then uses oxygen, CoQ10, um, NADH, FADH from your electron transport chain, and then you make energy. Okay. So it's like, like being oxygen deprived. What happens to your mitochondria? You can't make energy. So this is why people at high altitude, you know, you don't have as much oxygen and you have to get acclimated. Your, your bone marrow and your blood cells have to get acclimated to having less, ox less oxygen around. Um, if you are like carbon monoxide poisoning, go sit in your garage in your car and you don't open the door, you are going to basically squelch all oxygen in the body. Therefore, the, the electron transport chain can't work and you're not going to make ATP and then you die. There's even things like, I think it's a, uh, it's a bean. Uh, it's kava, not kava. Um, it's a, it's a bean that they make, make dish, oh, fava beans. If you leave, when you cook fava beans, you need to keep the lid off of it because fava beans make cyanide or something. Cyanide blocks 
the electron transport chain basically stops oxygen from being able to be used and you die instantly. So like if you breathe in the smoke, like if you're making these beans and you pull off the lid and you breathe in the smoke, like rumors, you could die from that. So you can eat them all the beans but you got to make sure you cook them right. And there's all this crazy stuff, but like, that's what your mitochondria is doing to make energy. So imagine if you have all these free radicals, your body's going to try to clean up those free radicals, but it's also going to create oxidant damage, like byproducts that your body's going to have to clean up. And then that puts pressure on the mitochondria. So, you know, and, and the other thing is a lot of these Western diseases that we see uh, metabolic diseases of all kinds. I mean, put diabetes in there, Alzheimer's, put autoimmune diseases in there, put Alzheimer's in there, um, put heart disease in there, uh, and then add insulin resistance into that, like the diabetes insulin resistance package, you basically get mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So linolenic acid, which is the main hufa oil that we're talking about here, that's what it is. Linolenic acid does about four things in your body. It's a pro-oxidant, so it causes oxidation. It's pro-inflammatory, so it causes inflammation. It's totally nutrient deficient. So this oil has no nutrients and it's toxic to your fat cell. And when I say nutrient deficient, is that like animal fats, like all good animal fats have vitamin A, D, and K2. And you need vitamin A, D, and K2 for like a million, jillion things in your body, including your immune system and mitochondrial support. So if you're not eating any animal fats and you're just eating tons of omega-6s that are nu nutrient deficient and don't have these, you are going to become nutrient deficient and you are going to become, I mean, how many people are vitamin D deficient? Mm -hmm. It is like 80 to 90% of the population, at least that I test is coming in under 30 and even functionally, you know, under 40, under 50. So again, you don't get those fats if you're eating these oils. Um, and then that nutrient deficiency, that toxic overload in the fat cell, that inflammation, and then that oxidation causes metabolic disease, causes insulin resistance, and then causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And then what do you have? People are sick, right? Mm -hmm. Really sick. So it's kind of complex, right? It's very complex. And this linolenic acid, it actually accumulates itself in the body fat. So that's how it stores itself in your fat. And over time, this is why, remember those statistics I said, like, um, what was that? In, in 1900, there was only 1.2% obesity, but by 1960, we see 13.4%. So how would that happen? Like, well, because as fat accumulates toxins and is holding on to this over time, the more you add into food supply, the more fat you're going to build. And then the more fat is going to store more toxin. And so it just kind of starts replicating itself really fast as it gets added into the food supply. So by, you know, 2018, you got 42.5% of people being obese. And what obese just means is that you have way too much fat on you. But if the fat cell is storing the LA, which is alanolenic acid, well, then could that be increasing the growth of the fat cell, right? And then the fat cell is now toxic. And when you look around, so like when we talk about hormones a lot, like estrogen, like a woman who's got a bunch of fat on her butt and her hips, that's actually good estrogen. That's protective estrogen for her. That's her reproductive estradiol. That's actually okay. Women are built to have fat on them. We reproduce, we have babies, we breastfeed, we do, we have cycles every month. We need fat, mm -hmm. but it's when you start laying fat around the middle that fat is not good fat. Like it's unhealthy for your heart and it's an estrone fat, which is more inflammatory. So you've got this vicious circle. So now you're seeing women and girls who historically always had fat on their butt and their legs. Right. And probably, I mean, I remember in the eighties being in school, it was pretty rare to see a girl like my age with like a big belly. I don't really remember that in, in school, but then again, I mean, I'm old, so maybe I don't remember everything, but I even think back to, you know, you see old pictures of like your grandma when she was a teenager. I mean, they had these tiny little waists, you know, and they're granted they wore corsets and they did all this like barbaric stuff to women to make them look skinny in the waist. 
Um, but historically, I think women were gaining a lot more weight in the lower body. And now I can go to my daughter's high school and see girls that are like ninth, eighth and ninth grade that have belly fat hanging over their pants. Mm -hmm. So that is really metabolically disrupting fat. And then the more processed food you eat and the more LA oil you eat, that fat just keeps getting poisoned and then it keeps growing. So this is why I think we're seeing this huge increase in obesity is because these fats that everybody but he's eating in the food supply is just storing itself in our fat tissues. And now we're laying down more inflammatory fat in places where we shouldn't be laying inflammatory fat. Now, a woman like my age, middle age, menopausal woman, she's going to naturally lay down more fat in her belly because she's got more inflammatory estrone, which is the postmenopausal estrogen. We're losing estradiol. So all of the middle-aged women come in and they're like, okay, I've never had a stomach. What the hell is this? What is going on? Now, part of that is nature. And part of that is we're losing that estradiol. So we're going to lay that down, but also think about our diets. And I have women coming into me day after day. I'm doing everything you're telling me to doing. I'm eating good. I'm exercising. I'm exercising more than I was. And I keep gaining weight. And that's like the more research I do into this stuff, I just go like, even when people think they're eating healthy and they go over to the health food store and they buy this healthy grain, you know, that's, or they buy this healthy tortilla or whatever, like everything has a freaking seed oil in it, everything. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're almost battling up a hill. Like you can't, it's like a, it's like a mountain you can't quite get to the top because now we've literally built it so high and it's hard to tell people to literally go home and almost everything they have in their house to get rid of it. And I struggle. I mean, I go, my daughter loves burritos, my youngest daughter. So like she wants refried beans and tortillas like for lunch every day. And it's school started today. So it's like, that's what she wants for lunch. Try to find a tortilla without seed oils in it. It is almost virtually impossible. And I've found some, but it's hard. It's in a regular grocery store. You're not going to find it. It's not going to be there. Um, and try to find like refried beans. You've got to get good organic, like refried beans with avocado oil in it or coconut or something, or you got to make your own refried beans, make your own refried beans because you're not going to find it. It's going to have seed oils in it. So it's so frustrating, right? Even me doing this research, I just go, oh my God. But this is, this is the world that we live in right now. And so my goal is to hopefully help people to understand it's, it's like a dose dependent too. This is the research I've done. So it's dose dependent, right? Like back in the day, we were only eating 1% of our diet. So that dose is maybe okay. But when you're eating, what is it? What did I say? Uh, when you're eating one third of your calories per day from this, that is a huge dose. So now the dose is poison. Remember, everything is poison. Everything can be poison, but it's based on dose. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we have going on now is that we've basically poisoned our food supply and we're poisoning ourselves. Mm -hmm. And again, it's innocent. We don't realize it because these fats have been touted to us as healthy right? Healthy. They're going to make you healthier. You're not going to have high cholesterol. You're not going to have heart disease, whatever. But the statistics are just not showing. This. And um, we have tons of Western diseases in our culture, tons of inflammation. Um, and seed oils are the single greatest caloric processed food we have. So if you're eating anything processed, you pretty much can bet there's a seed oil in there unless you've really been do done your due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of that, Hill, because it's 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 shocking. And I think it it shows truly how broken our food system is. And like you said, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but ignorance is not bliss with with these things. You you will get sick, you you will get disease. And the state that you're in um is going to to transfer into your offspring. Um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But it's 
it is so sad because people that do think they're doing good um, and, and are really trying, it, it takes another level of diligence that is a constant uphill battle, it feels like, um, when you're tackling these things. And um, most people, um, you know, go to just a normal grocery store. And though you can find some good things there, it, it takes more than that if you're really, really going to try to avoid these oils. And um, I think it was good how you just touched on that dose dependency piece, because I think some listeners might hear this and feel that like sense of overwhelm and want to go into their pantry and just throw everything away because it's it's just education is power, but it's also a burden sometimes because then then you know and you have to do something about it if, if that's important to you. So I think a, a good point to kind of wrap up with is if you just had to give a short little recommendation for people, I mean, I think you have highlighted everything so well um, and given some alternatives and just um, told people what can happen if you don't do something about this. Um, what would you just encourage people to do in a way that they're moving in the right direction, staying healthy, moving towards their goals, but can do their best to not just feel that just dread and overwhelm of the system that we're within and kind of feel that they have power and control over, over themselves? Yeah, you know, I, I, I found as I was researching this topic, because we've been talking about doing something for this for a while, is this, it's actually hard to find some research against them. Uh, there is some out there, but you kind of have to dig for it. And so it's a lot of doctors. I've pieced together this, you know, this talk from different presentations and lectures I've watched and um, things that I've looked at, but there is a huge push in the culture for to continue using these. And there's been a lot of money thrown at like heart disease and these other things saying, oh yeah, these seed oils are way better than animal products. I think there's a huge movement towards, we all know this in this world is like, they want you not to be eating animal products. This is the movement. And I don't know who they are, but whoever they are, they are heavily pushing the agenda that animal products are bad for you, that they cause heart disease, that they cause high cholesterol, that they cause um, you to gain weight, that they cause all these inflammatory diseases in the body. And yes, again, dose dependent animal products do, but we also see people doing the carnivore diet and doing these other where they're just eating that and they have reversal of autoimmune disease. Um, seeing people doing high fat keto diets and with animal products and they are losing weight and they're feeling good and their brains are working better. You know, I am a big proponent of a balanced diet. And what that means is I do think you need fiber. I do. I, I know for myself, I feel better with vegetables, um, the right vegetables. I try not to eat a ton of nightshades. Uh, just there's things that I know I don't do well with, but I'm a big proponent of vegetables. Obviously I'm a big gardener. So I think fresh veggies, I think root veggies, I think, you know, um, I, I think the way food is grown as well makes a huge difference. So to me, I'm a big proponent of just kind of whole food as much as you can get. Um, but, but because most of us have busy, crazy lives and we don't have big gardens and we don't have a farm and we're not like milking our own cow and we're not, you know, turning our own butter, is like if you're going to spend your consumer dollar, try as hard as you can to support the companies that are working hard to take that out of your food supply. And that may cost you more money in the short term. But I guarantee you, especially with the statistics that I see here that are quite alarming, is that if we do not make a change, our children, our grandchildren are going to be living in a world, we're already seeing it, where their life expectancy is less than ours, and their quality of life is going to be crap, because they're going to be inflamed, they're going to be obese, they're going to have massive metabolic disorders that are putting huge pressure on the medical system, and it's really just not sustainable, and I mean, any of us in the health world have been talking about that for 20 years, longer than that. You know, naturopaths have been talking about this for a century or more saying, you know, Weston Price wasn't a naturopath. He was a dentist. And he was saying, we can't be eating these processed foods. They are literally generationally killing us. They're structurally damaging us. 
they're destroying our teeth. They're destroying our brains. I literally had this, uh, I listened, I watched this one thing in 1911. Now, of course there wasn't probably as much science and research for sure. Let's take that into consideration. There was five diagnosed cases of Alzheimer's in the world in 1911. Okay. Today, they're saying one out of every three geriatric patients will have Alzheimer's disease or some sort of dementia. That's like cancer now. That's like that cancer statistic. Mm -hmm. What? What? Like we, and we, we are waiting for the miracle drug. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the miracle drug is? The miracle drug is your food. It is literally your food. And I just got back from Ireland, as you know, and I, every time I go to Europe, I'm reminded that the United States food supply is poisoned and Europe has other problems. We, you know, all countries, Russia has a better food supply than the United States of America. They have better control on the crap they add to their food, the processing that they do to their food. Um, I can't tell you a meal that I ate in Ireland, like even a continental breakfast at a, at a bed and breakfast that wasn't better than the best meals you'll get in a supposedly good restaurant here. Low sugar, low salt, flavorful, fresh dairy, fresh butter. You can tell they're using animal fats to cook a lot of their stuff. Um, and we flew back into the United States. And of course, any American airport is just tragic to have to try to find food in. And I just realized like the food supply, Supply in America is poisoned. And when I sit in the airport and I look around at the people, I think this is the medicine that is the medicine that can save us is the medicine that's killing us. It's that dose dependent idea, right? We're overeating the wrong type of food. And not only that, the pharmaceutical companies, the food lobbyists, um, and, and um, the chemical companies, they're all in bed together. And they're poisoning our food supply. And they're telling you it's going to make you fatter and healthier and decrease heart disease. And it's doing exactly the opposite. So my number one just resource would be one, that dose dependent thing. You need some omega-6s in your diet, but try to increase more omega-3s in your diet. That will help balance out that omega-6, okay? More um, wild fish, not farmed fish because they're fed pellets. And so they're higher in omega-6s. Remember that Any, anything that's farmed is higher in omega-6. Um, taking a good quality fish oil. Uh, omega fats are being shown to be very important for the brain and for longevity in general. And I think it's a really underutilized resource for really good health. And our ancestors used to eat a lot more omega-3s because they were eating a lot more omega. They were eating a lot more animal fats. So again, as the powers that be want you to move away from animal fat, they're actually pushing you into omega-6 and taking away that highly nutrient dense food that has all those fat soluble vitamins in them and all those good omega-3s that are important for decreasing inflammation and improving synapses in your brain and growing healthy babies and making wonderful breast milk. All of that's going away if we continue to go down the path that we're going. And so if you've got weight to lose, if your weight resist, you have weight resistance, meaning you cannot lose weight no matter what you do, the first thing to do is go into your kitchen and look for these seed oils. And I don't have an exact statistic on this right now, but I've heard that it can take up to a decade to detox these fats from your fat cells. Okay, so people want to lose weight now. And I understand that I have some patients struggle. It's horrible. It's depressing. It causes a lot of problems, but you have to start now and you have to decrease that dose so that over time, your fat cells can detoxify from just this one thing. I mean, we're not even talking about toxins that we're in, that we're exposed to that are outside of LA. I mean, not LA, the town, like linolenic acid, but like, um, so remember that it, this takes time and it's not overnight, but just make those simple choices and just prepare your food more. Just make mm -hmm. your own food, food prep. When I came back from Europe, I was like, I am growing my garden. I'm freaking getting a cow, I'm freaking milking it. I'm like, I am making all my own food again, because I realized like 
you know, a couple years, I haven't had a really good garden and I, I make excuses and I'm busy, but then I realize like I'm eating this food. I'm, I'm poisoning myself. Like I can't, I can't do this. So our whole platform was built on this. Like everything started with me and Ryan absolutely being dedicated to our food supply. And we still are, but we understand the work it takes, the diligence it takes. You understand this. Like in the last few years, we just have been building a business and growing and we just haven't had the time but it just took a reminder for me to be like, this is the most important medicine that I have. And if I neglect this, then I'm basically just telling my children that their lives don't matter. Right? So anyways, that's my happy end note is just try to use your food as medicine and keep your dose down and um, do not believe the food company. They do not like we have some food companies we work with, whatever, but you'll see there's companies that are really, really working hard to make these changes. Support those people, support those companies, spend your dollar with them and um, do the best that you can, you know? So that's my recommendation. Well, that was, that was great. I think that was a great end note, a great overview, a great conversation. And that's all that I have for you, Hill. Is there anything okay. else to add to No, the I think that's it. If anybody, um, you know, again, speaking of supporting, if anybody wants to support the podcast, please go to our partners page at stealthyhunter.com. Please support any of the product companies there. We continually are adding um, companies that we are supporting and working with. So if you want to spend your dollar in the hunting industry, in the food industry, in the health industry, please um, check out that partners page that does help our podcast. And Emily, I want to thank you. You're so fun to talk to. You let me ramble on forever. Um, and uh, you're super supportive. So thank you. Always, always. And I just want to add one more thing. If you guys like this today, this conversation with Hillary, everybody knows her expertise and how much she has to share and how much she cares about this stuff. So if you guys like this sort of um, podcast style today, if you want to email us over any hot topics, anything that you would like Hillary to touch on in these more brief podcasts, you can email those over to info at stealthyhunter.com and we'll compile those and we'll work on getting these out to you guys more so that you have the knowledge yeah. and the power to use your food as medicine and have control over over your life really yeah we're trying to do that because I get a lot of emails and I'm sorry I've said this before I can't respond to all of them I can't answer medical questions through an email but Emily's doing a great job at helping me um, with my administration so we're going to compile your questions and we'll just do some Q&A's and I'll just do my best to answer them through the podcast you're always welcome to come see me at my clinic in Bozeman, Montana. Again, the information's at the website and in the show notes, but uh, yeah, we want to, I want to answer your questions. It's just, again, I, I have so many hours in the day, right? We have so much, so many hours in our day <laughs> and I don't want to do all of it working. So <laughs> yeah, right. but okay. That sounds awesome. All right. Until next time. All right. We'll see you then. Hill. Bye. Yeah.